But we started off promising that we were going to look at five particular areas of, of benefiting from our data. And these five areas are the, are the way I look at, at, at most problems, right? Either as a troubleshooting problem, where something's gone wrong in your process and you use data from normal operation and from this bad operation, and you're trying to figure out what has changed. And you use tools like contributions and loadings to do that. Uh, learning from our data, I see that as a way just to confirm what we already know. Like the example with Mitsubishi where the polymer chemist that has been experienced for many years with these uh, raw materials and, and recipes sees, or, or we see rather in the loadings part, the same information that that person of many years of experience has. So we, we either confirm what we already know or we learn something new, hopefully. And that comes by inspecting the loadings part or W star C plus. Those to me are the most important parts actually from PCA and PLS, where I spend the most time uh, looking at we, we can obviously perform predictions if we've got a PLS model. Actually, even PCAs, right? We get X hat is equal to TP transpose. Sometimes, if we've got uh, just if we've got a PCA and we've got an X matrix, and uh, let's say we've got missing elements in that row, we're, we can use the fact that X hat is equal to TP transpose and calculate a prediction for those missing elements. So, prediction is not only for PLS; it's also for yeah. Prediction is also uh, when you're doing classification. So for those of you doing classification projects, you're predicting, is it class one or class two? Or do I get credit or don't credit? credit? Zero or one, um, or multi-class prediction. Process monitoring, we've, uh, we've looked at quite a bit, and there's process monitoring. You can either use a PLS model or a PCA model for that. What we're most interested in process monitoring models are SPEs, T squares, and scores. So we monitor the SPE, the T squares, and maybe we monitor the scores, the individual T1, T2 scores. The moment we see those going outside the limits, we generate contribution plots to see what's gone, what's gone wrong, to help us understand the problem much faster, or hopefully detect the problem much faster than we would have using univariate charts. And then the, this final section is optimization and control. We didn't really look at the control aspect in this course. Uh, it was something I was hoping to get to, but it's, uh, we'll, we'll leave that for another year. Optimization was what we've looked at today, though. How do we optimize our models and use them to improve our processes, developing new products? The control part actually is very similar to the part we did today on new product development. Except the difference is for, for control is we're, we're trying to target let's say our score space is over here, let's say our desirable point is being right at the center, our average point. Latent variable control says, if I'm at this particular location, how do I move to get to the center point? And in fact, you can use the same tools we covered in today's class to try and, and, and do that. So I see all the case studies in in these five categories, and most of the case studies fall in one category or the other, but sometimes you see a bit of, uh, of, of both in, in some, some of the work. Okay, so when you're looking at your course projects next week and the week after, one thing that will be interesting to point out to, to the class would be where you see your work falling into these, uh, into those categories. So that was what we want to achieve from our data, and over the weeks, yeah, we looked at, at, at the tools to get us there. Okay, so we started off by looking at PCA for quite some time, three, four weeks. In fact, uh, I think it was four weeks we spent on PCA and some of the applications of PCA because it's such a fundamental model to all of latent variables. Okay. PCA, some of the important things there with PCA are obviously the loadings and the scores and particular clustering in those loadings and scores. That's, that's, that's what we're often interested in. And interpreting the relationships between the variables in the loadings and interpreting the relationships between the observations in the scores. So we're decomposing our X matrix into scores T and loadings P transpose and understanding in a smaller dimensional space what's going on here in our larger X matrix. 
we often summarize these scores using what's called t squared, and we can take x hat and subtract it from x and get a residual matrix E. And that residuals matrix we can summarize in several ways. If we sum the squares along the rows, we calculate SPEs. If we sum the squares down the columns, we get the R squared values for a particular column. And if we summarize the entire matrix E, we get the R squared value. That's where the R squared value comes from. It's just the sum of squares of that error matrix. And we compare it and we ratio it to the sum of squares which is started off. So those are some of the important concepts from PCA that you should be totally familiar with now. We also spent a lot of time looking at the optimization derivation of decomposing X. So that was the day where we painfully derived the eigenvector decomposition on the board and the eigenvalue decomposition and showed that really PCA is nothing more than the optimal summary of the data in X. In fact, we showed from an optimization point, you can either see it as minimizing the sum of squares, I will just write that loosely as SSQ, sum of squares in the error matrix. PCA, that's the objective function for PCA. It also can be equivalently written as maximizing T transpose T for the variance for the eighth component. Okay? And we just keep doing that. That's the error matrix of the eight components. That's the T scores from, from the eighth component. Either approach gives you the identical solution. PCA falls out of those two objective functions. Okay, so again, another point of optimization. It's a very, very powerful tool to use. And like I said earlier in the class, if you haven't, Take an optimization course before you graduate, please do. Um, the other thing we looked at for PCA was the Nikels algorithm derivation, okay, which is nothing more than a series of alternating least squares to estimate this X matrix and estimate the scores in the lowest in an iterative manner. And that, that's important to understand the Nikels algorithm for PCA because we, we, we built on it to go to PLS, and then it's also, we built on that concept of the need as well to do the multi-block work, okay? During all of this discussion on, in those first four weeks, we covered several other important topics along the way, which will, even if you never remember PCA and PLS from this course, I hope that you'll remember the topics of cross-validation. as a way to avoid overfitting the data set. We looked at cross-validation PCA, we looked at cross-validation again in PLS. Both of those, uh, they're, they're done using similar ideas, but it's there to avoid overfitting your model and using too many components than are warranted by the data. After PCA, we moved on to process monitoring, and I, so I've already discussed process monitoring. We basically were looking at the scores, the T squared values, and the SPE values, and using that PCA matrix on new data. So that, where we showed the equations for new data, so if you've got X new, how to pre-process X new, and get to T new, once you've got T new, you can calculate X new hat, once you've got X new hat, you can calculate E new. Once you have E new, you can calculate SPE for the new observation. And also T squared for the new observation. So using the standard equations there for PCA, we can apply them to a, a new vector of data coming in. And we get a new vector once every time step. And we can plot these various metrics, either the scores or the SPE or the T squared, on time series plots over time. So it doesn't need to be time. Whatever the variable is in your in your um, in your x matrix going from top to bottom. But most often, if you're monitoring a process, it's time that's changing from one row to the next. But it need not be. And we plot these metrics t squared SPE, and we have some sort of limit over here. 
And as we're plotting these, what we're hoping or what we want to see is that we stay below the limit. But as we exceed the limit, we can then generate a contribution plot and go back to our real world units. So here, we're in the, in the reduced space. We're in the space of SPE and T-squared. This is not too useful to our operators to diagnose the problem. We need to go back to the original variables, one, two, up to capital K, and find out which one of those variables were most responsible for, for causing this limit to be exceeded. So that's the concept of process monitoring that we covered then in about the fifth week or so of the course. After that, we moved on to PLS. And we spent a bit of time talking before getting into PLS. We first looked at the shortcomings of multiple linear regression. So we had a bit of discussion there on how multiple linear regression will fail when you've got highly correlated variables. How multiple linear regression won't work if you've got missing data. So there was those two are, are compelling reasons, but there's other compelling reasons for using PLS. One is that PLS actually has a model for the X space. So you can check the quality of your incoming data in X before you make a prediction of Y. And tell and have a degree of confidence in that prediction, which is something you don't get from multiple linear regression. So PLS, PCR, and some PLS, these were three uh, variants of the latent variable predictions. Principal components regression is just the PCA followed by multiple linear regression. Sim PLS is uh, a simplified version of PLS where the objective function is very clear and easy to understand. And PLS actually gets very, well, it's almost identical solutions to PLS. Uh, so that distinction is, is really not too important for this class. More from a theoretical perspective that that difference is interesting. We also spent some time looking at the loadings plots and the weights plots for PLS. So the W star C plot, those are the two really important plots, W star C plots that are important for PLS. There's also, of course, the observed versus predicted plots, is the VIPs and the coefficient plots that we get from PLS. Those are of, of, of interest as well. And then we ended off the section on PLS by looking at the concept of correlation and causality and as well as the risks of using any empirical model, whether it's a least squares model, PLS model, whatever your regression model is that you're using, there's always a risk when you're basing it on empirical data. In other words, data that you've just happened to collect, but not from a designed experiment. Okay, so the, you can make some, some serious mistakes in interpreting those models. And we, we had a bit of a discussion there on that. Once we covered PLS and PCA, we then moved on to all these interesting applications for the rest of the course. So the first one we looked at was soft sensors, which is a natural application of PLS. And we covered topics there like um, lagging. I'm sorry, before we got to, uh, to, to lagging, in, in the soft sensors section, we just described the utility of soft sensors, right? That the major advantage for soft sensors is that you're getting your prediction of why much, much faster than waiting for the laboratory or waiting for some sort of time delay for your Y. And if you've got that prediction of Y, then you can use it for feedback control to, to uh, make sure your process is operating stably or to avoid false spec production. Then we realize, though, that sometimes these soft sensors, they require not just the raw data. We need to do some sort of pre-processing in addition to the centering and scaling. So nonlinear transformations of your X data, blocking, and lagging. So we spent some period of the class, which I, I called it advanced pre-processing. So that's kind of off here to the side, but that was that was needed in order to make sure that we get good predictions from the soft sensor models. And I said there in that, in that class, anything is fair game, any pre-processing is fair game, as long as it can improve your predictions for your soft sensor. And not just improve it, but you need to make sure from a cross-validation point of view that that, that that transformation you're applying holds. So you're not, in other words, you're not imp implementing a transformation that's only going to work well in your training data set. You need to make sure that it works well on testing data or cross-validation if you don't have testing data. Okay, so there's a whole variety of pre-processing tools that one can use that we covered there in that section. 
After the soft census, we covered, what was it? We, we, then we started going into some of these topics over here. I think the first one that we covered was image data. So we showed that doing a PCA on an image data set was the first uh, implementation we looked at of unfolding a 3D data set to a 2D data set. So image data, remember we had folded our image, so we got a long, uh, many, many rows, and we did a PCA on that, and then we, we performed what we called masking in the score space, where we, where we drew regions in the score space and found when the scores were under those regions, we could map them back to the image space. There are some interesting examples there from Honglu and Snapfood uh, as, as one particular case there. After image data, we, we actually came back to a PLS topic of classification. Uh, so some, sometimes in, the, in these courses, we probably push imaging data further down and cover classification right off the soft census. I chose to look at classification a little bit later in the course um, to look at it also not only from a PLS point of view, where we use PLSDA, but we also looked at multiple PCA models and where you, where you use what we call SIMCA, uh, Soft Independent Model Component by Analogy. Um, after the classification section, we did batch data analysis, which was, again, looking at a 3D data cube, but unfolding it in a different way. And in fact, we spent some time talking about different unfolding strategies in that batch section. And what, when you choose a different unfolding method, you actually get a very different objective being answered. Uh, so in our unfolding where we chose to unfold to one batch in each row, what that does is we're implicitly asking the model to describe to us the differences from one batch to the other. When we're unfolding down the columns, it's not very clear what that model is, is modeling. It's sort of just modeling the averages of, of, of all the batches over all time. There wasn't a very clear interpretation from that particular perspective. After the batch section, we moved it to multi-block data sets or multiple data sources. It's over here. And then from that was last week, and then this week we've looked at process optimization. So I'm not going to recap those two, two areas, those were, were very recent. Okay. So so that's where we sort of like a very quick tour of all the material we've covered in this course up to, up to today. And so I've got a bit more here on each one of these five areas. I won't go through these slides, there's, uh, there's enough text there for you. But just to end up by saying um, these tools, they're very generic in the sense that you don't see PCA and PLS as being only working for one particular type of data set. They can work wherever you would uh, use multiple linear regression, for example, you can exchange it for PLS. The other thing that's interesting is these tools don't introduce that much more complexity. Okay, sure, the theory is a bit more complex, and understanding the plots, like the loadings plots, can be a little bit complex, but for monitoring and online use, I've seen untrained people use them in a very easy manner because these tools don't really introduce something that's not been seen before. The monitoring plots, like these time series plots, they're nothing that an operator hasn't seen before. So you don't need that many additional skills to, to use these models. Sure, to, to build the models and understand them, you may need this course that we just covered, but from a daily use, um, many people can use these models without extra training. And furthermore, they're very straightforward to implement and use in an online manner. There's, there's, they solve very fast, there's all the linear algebra for the most part, um, so the calculations are quick and fairly straightforward. Okay. So 